When I first write, wrote it out this week, I wrote it down as Together But Apart. But I think if you want to keep my Plan B title, you can also keep this one in mind, which I said, uh, Keeping It Together, which I think we're doing a bit of that right now, too. May the written word and the spoken word lead us to the living word. Amen. So remember back just a few months ago, even as recently as what we would call winter 2020, a visit to the senior center was as simple as walking in the door. Schools were full to the brim. The malls were bustling. Arenas were nonstop with athletes of all ages, and soccer booked up for the next season. Churchgoers had many options for regular interaction with music practice, fellowship groups, potlucks, I miss the potlucks, and Sunday worship, just like clockwork. And everywhere, calendars with multiple bookings, sometimes to the point of overwhelming at times. And in the middle of all of that was the notion, gathering is good, go where the people are. We'll go to the next slide. So just this simple phrase, how does it feel now? If we flip the calendar forward just a few months, what do you think of now when you see these words? We know we're made for human connection and being together. And we know the Bible talks about even the simple fact of two or three of us gathering in God's name. All of that counts. And we're all made for that kind of connection, the eye contact, and the rush of the right kinds of um, hormones that make us happy when we're in the presence of other people who care about us. And even the more introverted and shy folks among us do require a certain amount of touch and talk and interaction not to excess, but to know that there is always an option to be together. So when the scripture readings for this month included a psalm that we've heard today about the loveliness and the goodness of being peacefully gathered together as brother and sister, it seemed to me like perfect timing. And the next slide just reiterates the verse again, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. And the next slide shows a bit of the history so depending on the translation of the Bible, the psalm speaks of living together, being together, and gathering together. So we don't typically spend a lot of time in the United Church, uh, in the Protestant Church in general, talking about the psalms. They are part of the old tradition of the Old Testament, and we tend to focus a lot on the good news stories of Jesus and his ministry with his teaching and preaching. But part of the Jesus story comes before in the time of King David. And we are told there are 15 psalms in a series in this part of psalms. And this one, number 133, is probably the last of four that would be attributed to King David. It's difficult to know when David would have written this song, and they are songs, but it's possible it may have taken place when he was finally considered king over all of the tribes of Israel, which would have concluded a really terrible time of national division and discord for many people. The Psalms are a unique part of the Bible, written in a special form of poetry, with instructions even for musical directors and musicians so they can perform the words. They cover a whole range of the human emotions and all the ways we can direct our fears and our hopes and our joys and our pains to God, the Maker. To me, they show the expressive and the vulnerable side of emotion. The times we bargain with God and cry out in our darkest moments but also the demonstrative side of relief and excitement and celebration and praise when our situation might turn around. So in case you're wondering, compared to now, yes, there were very dark times during the days of the Psalms being written too. The psalmist who wrote these verses knew, much, knew very much about intercultural complications, moments in the desert, real ones or dry moments of the soul, persecution and many tests of the spirit in a time when illness or an animal encounter could mean disaster, and a choice that went against the powers that be could mean certain death. So when a sign of relief and rest, and especially a sign of a difficult time and era being over, when that came, you can bet the psalmist would have reflected on that too. And so the, songs, the psalms do sing of these relief moments as well. So I know we're not in the relief moment here yet, 
we, we have feelings of it, but we're not, we're not totally resolved yet in our, in our moments here in our tumultuous and stressful times. So as we grapple with the months behind us of restrictions of human contact and limited gatherings, and now with the uncertainty of how and when to start some kind of safely gathering again, there's a certain wistfulness that comes of knowing exactly how hard it can be to spend so much time apart. And like many of you, I'm sure, I struggle with the uncertainty of this pandemic and what it's brought to us, how we have to balance caution with a sense of normalcy for ourselves and our families and trying not to worry too much about the unknowns because wouldn't we dearly love to have everything answered and know what's to come next? Some of the questions we're thinking of are how long? What's normal? How can we help? Are we doing enough? And what's the next right thing? And in times like this, I always find myself drawn back to signs of hope, of adapting, of innovation and creativity, and finding new ways to live and serve. So today I've gathered some examples that brought a smile to my face over these months as people have found ways to show their resilience and care and creativity in this very bizarre and challenging time. So <laughs> this one I've called the plastic hug. And I'm not a health practitioner, so I can't condone that anyone tries this, but I'm just saying I love the thought that someone found a way to mimic the feeling of being together and pushing someone else's heart against yours behind a shower curtain. I think that is a, a pretty neat way of letting the, creative, letting the creative and crafty thinkers shine during a crisis. So someone obviously said, well, we can't breathe on each other, so how can we get around this? And in the early days of the pandemic, I noticed the crafters and the factories were the ones that seemed to know how to respond in creative ways. We had people that know how to work with cloth, retooling those things into masks, any which way from pillowcases to sheets and finding ways to protect each other. And factory workers found ways to turn lines from making things like vodka into hand sanitizer pro production, which has been very valuable to keep everyone safe at this time. So we know that there is not much that's harder than missing the eye contact and the physical presence of being together. Changing how we touch is challenging. So I've noticed handshakes are turning into waves or elbow taps or toe taps if you're feeling very balanced. And sometimes a pat on the heart or even jazz hands can work. But my favorite adaption still is the, is the hug screen. I think it's a, a pretty neat little construction. So this one I'm calling the earbud walk. And I don't know that everyone here uses uh, earbuds when they're out for a walk. I know I normally don't. Um, in early during lockdown, our family tried doing some emergency video calls because we wanted to see people. And so we tried ways to see each other and talk, which is a little confusing when we're all in different generations and trying to navigate all the sounds and the logins and the, everything that had to happen to make us see the grandkids and see the parents all at once. It seemed at first we really wanted to see everyone's faces, even though it wasn't real. But in my life, I've found being on all these screens all the time and seeing myself on a screen all the time is psychologically wearing, and I'm starting to pull away from all the screen time. It sort of feels artificial, but um, I find we're, we're all finding new ways to connect, and I know people in the cities are finding ways to find those good pathways to have a walk with someone and spread out so you can still see someone, but you're not as close as before. And I hope most people are being respectful of those distances for each other's sanity. So last week, my unexpected treat was I had a call from my girlfriend in Montreal, and I had my earbuds close by, which if you've ever used earbuds, you know they're never where you want them, at least they aren't in my case. And they were handy, and I was just about to take advantage of a beautiful night that wasn't too hot and wasn't too stormy. And so we decided to walk together. And so this is my, my version of what we did. We, she walked through Montreal. I walked through the countryside near Belmont. And we had to stop once to let some grain buggies go by for the noise. But other than that, we were able to share that time together and uh, just cover all the bases. We talked about why we can't convince everyone to wear a mask, how we're going to heal the world for the next generation, and a few other small tasks. We didn't quite solve all the world's problems in that phone call. But for me, it felt a lot better and a lot closer than waiting for the next time we might be able to plan some interprovincial road trip. So it was an innovation that worked for me. So this one on the slide says, virtual family reunion. 
and it's not one that I've actually attended, but I wanted to point out the bottom. They, someone was very creative here, and they said, this reunion has no ants, no egg toss, no excuses. So there was no need to commute. And I, I've noticed, as I was helping to plan my family reunion, that people are finding ways even to do these gatherings differently and still have that family connection. So last weekend, the long weekend in August, is when my, one of my extended families always gathers. And part of my family is the Milnes, and we spread across different parts of Ontario and beyond. And it was our year to host the camping and the eating and the games all in our front yard on the farm under the big tree. But it was not to be, and we decided we had to postpone so that we wouldn't encourage folks to travel between the districts, which was really hard because we love hosting it, and my kids love meeting their extended family and spending time with just a big group of everyone that accepts each other. So instead, my cousin and I from London, we did a FaceTime call, and we planned an impromptu virtual reunion. So what does that include? Well, for us, it meant people had to be somehow near a computer or a device to be connected. But we found a way to do um, a potluck with photos and recipes, with a recipe book to follow. We challenged folks to do a scavenger hunt with pictures. And we had a, a fitness challenge, so everyone was to track their steps and their movement throughout the weekend. And we have some very competitive family members, so everyone's still waiting for the points to be released. But next time I won't do so many points. It's way too much work to add all this up. But I think maybe my favorite part was we were able to have a Sunday service. So I wasn't preaching last week, and I got my notes together, and I decided, OK, I will sing by myself. And I did a Facebook Live service for our family. And it was just like this weather, so I was under our porch, facing nature behind me. And we were able to uh, worship together. We have a long tradition in our family with the United Church. And so our service included up to 47 different Facebook accounts, which could be more than one person. And we had folks from my area, Oxford County, London, uh, Ottawa area, St. Louis, Missouri, Wisconsin, and possibly even Israel, while one of my cousins is living in Israel. So like I say, we're still working on the points, but we the main thing we managed was the connection. We found a way to connect each other, and the folks that could definitely not travel right now in different countries had a way to be part of all the fun and the silliness together in a different way. So we can still be together just differently. All right. So there's more than one miracle out there right now, but the one that really caught my attention because I work in farm country with a lot of different farm groups is the May 16th miracle in Chatham-Kent. So Chatham-Kent area only has about 105,000 people through the whole rural countryside. And they were looking to do a food bank drive. And somehow they managed to get a program set up and a map. And people could leave out their items safely. And volunteers could come and pick them up without touching. And they were finding a way to feed their neighbors. They managed to get 5,000 volunteers to collect 339 tons of food for the food bank, which I think is pretty amazing because everyone found a way to work around the situation. And I just find that kind of thing so encouraging because we just have to keep doing the next right thing even if we have to get around some logistical nightmares. So hats off to the people in Chatham Kent who pulled that one off. I need another one. So funerals. This one's a hard one. It's devastating to lose a loved one at any time. But the pandemic has made that worse. So at first, we know groups of 10 was the limit. And so anyone expecting that rush of support of being physically surrounded by loved ones at this time, for this one of life's most precious rituals, it wasn't really available in the same way. So people had to go through a very small grieving process with very few people or wait. And in both situations, it's just so hard to watch people struggle through that hurt and expecting the rituals that we're used to. But what I notice and what I find hopeful is that we're finding ways even to adapt this ritual. And I was actually presiding at a funeral on Friday at um, Forest Lawn, and they're doing this. So they, they live stream to the family. So anyone who can't travel for distance or protocols around boundaries and borders or due to their own concerns of health, people can still watch if they can find a screen. 
And I just think it's so important that people have a time to be together and share those words and share those tears together and hear the scripture so that they have some time to process what's changing in their lives and when they're saying goodbye to this person that they've felt connected to that process. So again, it's a gathering, but it's modified. And this one is um, related to the events this week. Uh, We've been thinking and praying a lot about our friends in Beirut who are now struggling with not only a pandemic and huge amount of political strife, but also an unexpected huge explosion that now they've got over 100 people have died and thousands are without homes and there's just so much fear right now and it's it's a really difficult time and many people from Lebanon that have already been displaced are holding vigils all around the world. So I was really encouraged to see that even the vigils are changing but staying the same. So they're finding ways to do those rituals together, light the candles, pray and be together but with masks and with distancing because we still need to find a way to face each other and be together to deal with our fears and our grief at any time. And this one is just maybe the simplest of all, is the people I know who stay on the routine of the calls and the cards. And I've heard of a woman who uses her Christmas list now, and she picks a number of people on her list every day or every week and just calls people. And she's comfortable at home and she's a bit lonely, but she just makes the time to call people and see how everyone's doing. And some people do the same with a handwritten note or a little treat in the mail. And I really hope that all these little gestures are adding up to give a boost to the sender and to the receiver. It's not a grand gesture. There's no technology involved, thank goodness. Sometimes we need a break from the technology. It's just an old fashioned boost to give people a bit of connection at a time when they can't be as close as they would like. And just neighborhood visiting. This one's not from London, but it reminds me of some of the neighborhoods around here. And I just love seeing how people are finding ways to be together. We were saying this weekend when I asked my, my spouse and my daughter what things they've liked seeing about the pandemic, like what people are doing for each other. And we realized we've probably seen our neighbors more in the last five months than we ever have. Because they're just there and we're just here and there's nowhere else to go. So we're having a lot more backyard visits or spread out around the bonfire visits or back porch type gatherings, just very simple, very small. But I know folks in the pews here and that are watching are doing the same. You're finding ways to get together in the park or to see people, whether it's you know from the sidewalk to the stairs, just so that people can get a boost. Not everyone can leave their homes easily and people that are alone are feeling especially isolated. So I know that people are also involved in all the ways we've been able to modify how church is being done and there's lots of programming and planning going on to keep the safety, but also to allow some kind of hybrid of worship models and connections so that people can still feel supported and still feel the spirit moving through them even when they're separated. All right. So. Obviously this is yoga, not everyone is is a yoga person, but I just like the image because yoga is typically spread out anyway. And now it's just more about measuring than it used to be. Because usually if you practice yoga, you try to not be too close to somebody so you don't maybe bump them or kick them by mistake if you're maybe not the most coordinated yogi around. I might know something about that. But I love seeing that people that are the instructors who know the value of the people being together are finding ways to have yoga outside Um, I know people that have been able to go back to their practice, and if the day is nice, they can still see their their group that they're used to seeing and have that spiritual time together and take care of their bodies and their spirit's needs. And I have another friend who's part of a a rowing club in London, and the rowing's not an option, but they're determined to keep fit and keep together because they rely on each other a lot. They're all cancer survivors, and so they have a schedule of who has the yards and who can meet distantly and sort out their fitness time together so they can all stay in good shape up here and in here and in here all at the same time. So I just wanted to go back to the church conversation because that's what we're about here is we're obviously gathered in a church and we're doing a lot of adapting and reaching out 
And uh, I think there's probably many families who've done church in their pajamas now and uh, stretch out on the couch. Maybe the cats get to go to church and they didn't go before. Maybe some dogs are going to church too. Uh, I think I'm encouraged that some people have found that other folks from different places or other folks that aren't so sure about church buildings or know what to expect are feeling welcome into a worship service because they can choose their comfort level. So what I notice about that is we're stretching beyond our building in ways that no church community or no church committee would ever have imagined before we were told by the government we had to be locked down. So we're being forced in a creative way to find ways to surpass what any of our structures could provide. And I know we're missing the closeness and maybe just me, but some of us are also missing the music. You can use apps and different formats to get music and have people sing together across technology, but it still does not feel the same. But I know when we're innovating, we're finding ways to expand the mission of Jesus in loving our neighbors as they would wish to be loved. And when we make these new connections work, I hope we all experience that small boost of joy as a surge of God's love throwing, flowing through that experience to carry us through the next challenge. And maybe some of us can relate to the image of the goldfish because I thought they're kind of in their own bubbles in goldfish land, aren't they? So we talk a lot about bubbles right now and trying to stay in smaller groups as much as we can. But what I like about the fish image is that they can still see one another and they can still communicate in whatever way a fish might choose to communicate. I hope we're not going to get too hung up on the details of the events and the gatherings not feeling like normal because normal may not be here for a while and normal might have to change. But maybe if we focus on the ways that we can use technology or creativity or that postage stamp or a phone call or a lawn chair visit, I feel like that creativity and that intention and all that amount of faith will help us appreciate and give thanks for those small moments that we're finding together. That the extra precautions and learning of new skills will just be a bump in the road and a sign of how much we can care for our communities. That we can enjoy these moments of gathering and togetherness, whatever form they take, with our brothers and sisters. Wherever we gather, however we gather, May we do so with thankful and hopeful hearts. May it be so.